Welcome everyone to Have History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and when we last left Thomas, he was exercising independent command in Kentucky, where he won a victory at the Battle of Mill Springs. Now, Thomas was headed to Tennessee. Thomas's division joined Don Carlos Buell's Army of the Ohio in its invasion of Tennessee. That army was on a trajectory to assist Union General Ulysses S. Grant in capturing Middle Tennessee and combating the Confederate Army that was assembling at Corinth, Mississippi. The Battle of Shiloh erupted on April 6th and continued into April 7th. Buell's army arrived on the night of the 6th and helped push the Confederates off the field, but Thomas would arrive late and take no part in the battle. Over the next month or so, a series of promotions and reorganizations took place in the Union Army in the West. Henry Halleck butted heads with Ulysses S. Grant, and to get rid of Grant, Halleck gave him a promotion to second in command in the West, which took his army away from him. In his place, Halleck placed Thomas. Thomas would command the Army of the Tennessee through the Siege of Corinth. The Confederates evacuated the city, and Thomas found the sanitation of the entrenchments repulsive, so he ordered an overhaul of the camps to take place. Many of his men fell ill before the camps could be whipped into shape. Once Corinth was under Union occupation, Thomas asked to be relieved, out of courtesy to Grant. Halleck acquiesced, and Thomas went back to division command under Buell. Halleck divided up the armies in Tennessee, with Grant working toward capturing Vicksburg, and Buell capturing the rest of Tennessee. Buell and Thomas moved toward Chattanooga, and by July, the Army of the Ohio was in northern Alabama, with Thomas's men occupying Tuscumbia. While there, politicians and military leaders began to criticize the slowness and timidness of Buell, and Thomas's name came up to replace Buell. The military governor of Tennessee, Andrew Johnson, pushed for Thomas to be given a command to invade East Tennessee. Thomas wrote to him saying, we have never yet had a commander of any expedition who has been allowed to work out his own policy, and it is utterly impossible for the most able general in the world to conduct a campaign with success where his hands are tied, as it were by the constant apprehension that his plans may be interfered with at any moment. He assured Johnson that General Buell's disposition will eventually free all Tennessee and go very far to crush the rebellion entirely. If our army will not permit itself to degenerate into idleness, the rebels will be crushed out in 60 days, for the Confederacy cannot possibly subsist its troops a great while longer. In the late summer of 1862, while Buell waited, the Confederate Army of the Mississippi and the Army of East Tennessee began their heartland campaign that would take them into Kentucky. Braxton Bragg would move his army through the Cumberland Plateau and remain, for the most part, undetected until he emerged out of the plateau either toward Nashville or Kentucky. Buell did not know the intended target. Thomas suggested the army concentrate at McMinnville, which was about halfway between Nashville and the eastern route to lead into central Kentucky. Buell waved off that idea and had Thomas and his army concentrate further to the south. Bragg took the eastern route and bypassed Buell and Thomas. Afraid that the Confederate Army was about to attack Nashville, Buell concentrated his forces at Murfreesboro and sent Thomas to garrison Nashville and prepare its defenses. Bragg pushed on into Kentucky and now it was a chase to catch up to the Confederate Army as it marched into the Bluegrass State. Buell left Thomas at Nashville while he moved into Kentucky. The Union troops found out that Thomas wanted to attack Bragg in Tennessee and their opinion of Buell lowered and their admiration of Thomas rose. Henry Halleck and Secretary of War Edwin Stanton also began to have little confidence in Buell, so they conspired to put Thomas in command of the Army of the Ohio. They sent a staff officer to give Buell the orders. In Louisville on September 29th, the staff officer arrived. Buell called Thomas to his headquarters and was willing to give command of the Army to Thomas, but Thomas refused. Thomas would write to Halleck that, General Buell's preparations have been completed to move against the enemy, and I therefore respectfully ask that he may retain in command. My position is very embarrassing, not being as well informed as I should be as the commander of this army and on the assumption of such a responsibility. Thomas would later say, I am not as modest as I have been represented to be. I did not request the retention of General Buell in command through modesty, but because his removal and my assignment were alike unjust to him and to me. It was unjust to him to relieve him on the eve of battle and unjust to myself to impose upon me the command of the army at such a time. This was only part of the reason why he decided not to take command. He hated politics, and wanted to be assured that politicians wouldn't overrule his decisions. While in Louisville, Buell reorganized the army, and took Thomas's field command away. 
making him second in command of the army. It appears as though Buell intended to use Thomas as his surrogate in places he could not be, but this still limited Thomas. The three corps commanders were Alexander McCook, Thomas L. Crittenden, and Charles C. Gilbert. Gilbert's arbitrary punishments and harsh treatment of volunteers resulted in his men resenting their commander. As the army was to march out of Louisville to engage Bragg, a regiment hadn't received their pay like the rest of their brigade, and they refused to move. Gilbert arrived and let loose a string of profanity directed toward the mutineers, then ordered an artillery battery to blow them away. When the gunner refused, Gilbert got even more angry. Thomas stepped in, seeing that Gilbert was just making matters worse. Thomas approached the regiment and said in a quiet, reasonable tone, Boys, I am sorry marching orders came before you were paid off, but we are on a very important march, and in all probability will get Bragg before he gets many miles away. Now if you will fall in, I will promise you the next stop we make long enough, I will have the paymaster there, and you shall be paid before you move again. The soldiers cheered Thomas, saying, All right, Pap, we will go. The Union Army moved out, and part of it found the Confederate Army near the town of Perryville. Buell sent word for Thomas, who was with Crittenden's corps, to make sure Crittenden got his men into motion and then report personally to the Army commander. Thomas didn't receive the orders until 3 a.m. on the morning of October 8th. Instead of riding ahead, he stayed with Crittenden's corps, and this resulted in him missing the entire Battle of Perryville. The next day, Bragg and his army began its retreat out of Kentucky, and so did Buell. On their way back to Nashville, destroying private property was common for both Union and Confederate soldiers. One incident infuriated Thomas. A known Unionist in Kentucky complained that a Union officer had stolen his horse. Thomas overheard this and asked the farmer to identify the man responsible. He identified an officer, and Thomas asked the soldier if it was true. The officer admitted to impressing the horse for his use. Thomas took his sword, put it under the shoulder straps of the man's uniform, cutting them away. Then he ordered the man to dismount and return the horse with pay for any inconvenience experienced by the farmer. Buell, Thomas, and the army made it safely to Tennessee, but big changes awaited the army.